Good morning, everybody. <laughs> um, Good morning. Welcome to the Writers of Kern monthly meeting um, with our featured speaker, uh, Nancy Ellen Dodd. So I'm new. This is my first um, meeting as a host <laughs> and as the president, as the new president of the Writers of Kern. Um, so I want to thank the board officially for everything that they've done, past and um, current. Um, so they're, they're definitely helping making this transition a lot easier for me. So um, this welcome message might go a little fast just because I uh, am very nervous. <laughs> so, um, so I'm just going to jump right into doing the um, uh, recognizing our submissions and rejections and successes. Um, as writers, you know that we have to submit our work and as part of that process, um, we get rejections and we get a lot more rejections than, than acceptances. So it's just part of the process. So um, first I want to ask if anyone has submitted and if they've gotten a rejection. Carla, I see Carla and Pam. Uh, let's see, who else? Bill, Terry, and Annis. Annis. <laughs> yeah. And Diane. And Diane. <laughs> and myself. <laughs> I, I sent in some pitches that didn't get, didn't get, uh, that were also rejected. So, okay. And uh, Jacqueline also. Okay. Um, so who, um, who got an acceptance? Anybody? Pam? Yeah, <laughs> and Terry, good. Hey. That's good. Um, see if I could see anybody else. Keep your hands raised if you if you got an acceptance so I can look for you. Uh, Terry, we got. And Pam, I see Terry and Pam. Okay, congratulations, guys. Congratulations. <laughs> I forgot to congratulate the rejections too. Congratulations on the rejections too. Um, any successes that anybody would like to share? Je um, Jeanette. Yep, hang on. I got to unmute her. Mm -hmm. uh... um, I guess my, my little success was I have published a small, uh, a short story on Kindle Vela, which is a new platform that Kindle started up. And I've done it under a new pen name, um, Anne Lovelace. So, so that's kind of fun and exciting. That's cool. That's my sister's last name, Lovelace. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> oh, it's one of my direct ancestors' names actually. So I thought I'd like to honor her with that. Congratulations. Congratulations. Anybody else? Joan, yeah. let me let me uh, unmute you. There you go. Since I had a little bit of extra time this month, <laughs> <laughs> I um I finished the first full first draft of my second middle grade story. I wrote thirteen thousand words in the last ten days. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Um, we have it in the chat from Bill. Uh, I received a rejection from, uh oh, where to go? I received a rejection from a query dated April 2nd, 2020. At least the agent replied, for which I thanked her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a whole year later. <laughs> yeah that's good congratulations okay i don't see any other hands okay <clears throat> all right i'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to um sandy for the announcements Okay, so um, we're, we're being brief this morning, and that's good. We want to give Nancy as much time as possible. So um, just a little bit of housekeeping first. Um, uh, you will be muted through the presentation. So if you have a question that you would like to ask Nancy, she wants us to be interactive. So you can either use the raised hand thing on your 
on your um, device, or you can physically raise your hand, or you can write your question in the chat, and then we will unmute you and you can ask your question. Um, <clears throat> um, just uh, want to remind everybody that um, the first Monday of each month, we have a member only event, which is Open Mic Monday, and that is headed up by Annis. And so, um, uh, again, that is a member only event. And then a, a second perk for being a member is we have a, a book club, which is the second, this is so confusing, the second Thursday of odd months. Now remember that, second Thursday of odd months. Um, I won't remember that. Uh, and in uh, on your agenda, but if you didn't print it out, if you ever have any questions, you can email us at info at writersofkern.com. Uh, or you can email me directly at membership at writersofkern.com. Um, don't send your questions to any other place or they might not get answered. Um, and then just uh, online for the time being, we're continuing all of our meetings online. So August 2nd is our next Open Mic Monday. Is that correct, Ms. Annis? Okay, perfect. And then our speaker for August will be uh, Cecil Castellucci. And I, I don't know Cecil, but um, Sin does. And so she's excited about, about uh, Cecil coming. And for the full um, spectrum of what we have coming up and all the things that are going on and links to past workshops, you can go to writersofkern.com uh, slash events and you can see all of that. So, um, at that point, I'm going to, unless there's any immediate questions that could be answered very quickly before we get started, I'm going to turn it back over to Cynthia, and we're going to go ahead and get started a little early with our speaker. Okay. Thank you, Sandy. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, so Nancy Ellen Dodd is the author of The Writer's Compass, From Story Map to Finished Draft in Seven Stages. She is also an instructor and editor. She earned her MPW, Master's in Professional Writing, and an MFA in Playwriting from USC. She teaches advanced screenwriting at Pepperdine's Sever, Sever College and has published more than 130 articles in local and national publications. She is currently earning her PhD in Global Leadership and Change. So I'm going to hand it over to Nancy. Oh, um, I'm sorry. I have, a, before I hand it over, um, Carla has a question. Can you tell us a little bit about Cecil coming in August? Cecil Castellucci, she's a, uh, she's a New York Times bestseller. She's a YA author and she's written, um, she writes genre fiction, speculative fiction, and uh, she also has a children's book and she writes comics. <laughs> so um, a write-up about her will be coming soon. So, okay. Um, now I'm going to hand it over to Nancy. Well, thank you for inviting me. You know, those of you who heard me talk before, I love this group. You can't hear me? Oh, we can hear you. I can hear you. Oh, um, okay. Terry, Terry was having trouble hearing, so. Okay. Um, so, I love this group. I started writing in this group and uh, I'm excited to be back talking with you again and talking about tension and um, Sandy told me that I usually teach a four-hour screenwriting class and he said I couldn't do that today so I'm sorry I can't give you the full four hours so I'm gonna cram what I can into about an hour so that she can get home to her grandchildren coming from New Jersey. Yeah. So I want you to know that um, I love interactive <laughs> classes. It's a little harder on Zoom, but I love interactive classes. Um, please feel free to answer, ask questions and you know, let's have a dialogue here. And if I say something wrong or you don't agree with, that's okay. I always encourage dialogue about differences, um, but know that I'm right. Just case you know if there's any question I'm right so anyway um so what I'm, we're going to start with 
And while we're doing this, I have to close my window because um, I think there's something making me allergy and I'm uh, allergic to something. I'm going to lose my voice. I want you to write a sentence from a current work, a past work, a new work, but I'd like you to write at least a sentence, maybe two sentences with tension that include tension in the sentence. What you perceive as a tension filled sentence. And I'll close my window while you do that. Okay, so in a little while, um, we'll, we'll look at those. First, let me ask you, how many of you, I, on the handout, I ask you to write, um, take, take something you've written before, take a, a moment of tension out of that, and then expand it to 150, 200 words. I think that's what I ask you to do. Let me look and see what I ask you to do. Uh, choose a paragraph from your writing that needs to be full of tension, break it down into moment by moment series of action, and then use brief active sentences to increase the tension or see if you've actually diminished the tension. And I gave you some examples in here. And so what I'd like to do is later we'll spend a little bit of time and look at those paragraphs, those of you who'd like to volunteer to share. Um, could you raise your hand or put in chat. Let me know if you have um, a paragraph prepared you'd like to, to um, for us to look at. And believe me, I, I don't do harsh critiques. My approach to teaching is always about positive feedback that's for growth, not about critical feedback to tear people down. It's always like, what could you add to take it one step higher? So don't be afraid to share. So do we have anyone who um, is going to share that with us, share something with us? Yes, OK, Jacqueline. Jacqueline, Jacqueline. Hello. Hi. Um, so I'm going to ask you in a little while. Don't let me forget, Sandy. We're going to, when I get to that point, Jacqueline's one of the people who's going to share. And maybe, maybe you, uh, more of you will want to share as we go further along. Okay, so we're talking about tension. Tension is the engine of your story. It drives the audience from page to page, chapter to chapter, all the way to the end of your story. One of the things that helps build tension is your story is to know what your story question is. What is the question that your readers want answered by the end of the story? The question you're posing. For example, for Star Wars, will Luke, St <clears throat> sorry, will Luke Skywalker become a Jedi and save the galaxy from the Death Star? So that's what I see as the question for that first movie. So, when you think about your writing, always think of what the overarching question is that your reader wants answered. Your reader is reading to find out the answer to this. And by having that question, it helps you to build the tension <clears throat> across that question. So there's a New York book editors column. And if you wanna jot this down so that you can look it up, they have some great advice. And it's New York book editors. And the, the um, column is called Tension. What is it and how to develop it in your novel? So if you do a search on any part of that, you should come up with that article. It's great reading. I pulled actually pulled a couple things from that and a couple things from my book. So in, the, in that column, one of the things they said is the most effective way to elicit an emotional response in your reader is through tension. 
And that emotional response is part of engagement with your reader. It's part of making them feel connected to what you're writing. So you want to engage them through emotion and using emotion increases tension as they can care about your characters, as they care about what happens, as they care about whether or not your character um, achieves their goal in their story. This is a, a paragraph I lifted from that same column. <clears throat> conflict and tension work hand in hand because conflict ideally leads to tension. Notice I said ideally and not always because conflict doesn't inevitably create tension. In order for conflict to lead to tension, there needs to be an emotional connection with the characters. You need to care about your characters. The audience needs to care about what happens or else you can have a lot of dead bodies, zombies and broken hearts, which are conflict, but never, get in, never create emotional investment and anticipation, which is the tension. So every page of your work, um, novel, screenplay, short story, whatever, must contain some form of tension in it. Your major tension comes from, as we said before, being related to the story question. And then it's related to we care about the characters. The retention comes from the current obstacle. What's the current obstacle your character is fighting to reach their goal? And we'll talk more about that in a minute. What's the underlying tension? What's going on between characters but that we know there's some form of either romance or, or disagreement or uh, enemy antagonist versus protagonist? What's the underlying tension, uh, underlying uh, obstacle? This creates the underlying tension, I'm sorry. And then there are lesser tensions related to a particular moment or time in the story. For example, this was, I just wrote this morning, um, for this class, he was angry and there was a yellow feral cat whining at him, hissing, standing in his way. There was only one way to deal with a situation like this dot, dot, dot. So the tension is built when you start thinking, oh my gosh, what's he going to do? Is he going to do something to that cat? How is he going to handle it? Now it could be he goes a different way, skirts around the cat, could be does something a little more violent, but you've, most people have an emotional reaction to what happens to animals. So immediately they're concerned about what's going to happen to this animal. So that helps to create the tension in what you've written. Okay, um, so what I'm gonna say now is about rewriting because you may be thinking about tension as you write your first draft and you may not be thinking about it. So what you wanna do is make sure in your rewrites, that's one of your stages of your rewrites is to look at tension and how tension, do you have enough tension in this story, in this page, in this chapter? <clears throat> so see, these are some of the things to think about as you're developing tension in your rewrites. You wanna answer, you want to create questions that the audience is gonna say, what's gonna happen next? So you constantly have that question like we did with the cat. What's gonna happen next? And then you want smaller answered questions, smaller questions that you then answer. We answer, he skirted around the cat. So we have a sigh of relief. But then you wanna create a larger question. So we think that's solved. Yikes, now it's worse. Because when he took the, the, the bad guy was just around the tree on the other side and now he's run directly into him. Whatever it is, the, the, when you answer a question, it should evolve 
into a larger question with a bigger jeopardy. Um, a, threat, a threat to the pro protagonist or a threat that the protagonist must handle. These are areas where you can create more tension. So for like a sheriff in a Western, a policeman or a detective chasing the bad guy, um, a fighting relationship in a romance and a friendship. These are things that help create tension. A threat where your protagonist doesn't want to handle it, but is being challenged to do so. For example, the reluctant hero doesn't want to go out and, and um, save the girl tied to the, to the um, rails because the train's coming. There's a threat to the girl, there's a threat to him. He's reluctant to do anything. So there's a tension in that reluctance. So such as uh, Han Solo and Star Wars. Han Solo did not want to fight on behalf of the galaxy. He just wanted to live his own life. He wanted to be left alone. But the tension was between, in getting him to take action. There's tension in information that the audience or a lesser character that the protagonist doesn't know. I lost my place, I'm sorry. So either we know something, maybe lesser characters know something, but the protagonist doesn't know it. And in the protagonist not knowing it, that creates tension. Example <clears throat> for that would be, um, Luke and Leia are twins, but Luke doesn't know it. And we know it before, we know it, I believe we know it before Leia knows it, then Leia knows it. And then eventually Luke knows it. And at the very end, Han Solo knows it. Or Darth Vader is Luke's father. And um, I don't remember if we knew that before he said it, I don't think we did. I think we found out at the same time as Luke or information that the protagonist has that influences decisions but can't be shared. Leia knows Luke is her twin brother, but doesn't she can't tell him. Luke and Han Solo don't know. Han Solo gets jealous because he doesn't know about this. And he's finally getting ready to be open in this relationship. And then he thinks, oh, you're in love with Luke and backs off. So now we've created a whole nother level of tension. So let's, take go to flashbacks for a minute flashbacks are a constant state of concern when do you use flashbacks how many flashbacks do you use where do you start uh the flash do you start with flashbacks it's a it's a big issue when i was first learning writing um in the early days of walk we were the whole the overall feeling was no flashbacks everyone was against flashbacks but then you couldn't really tell a story without some level of flashbacks so then that's a whole nother um discussion is how to use flashbacks so going back to uh the you know new york um, book editor column um very often flashbacks diminish tension in your story and require careful use the flashback must infuse enough tension to impact the current situation for the characters. In general, the tension within a flashback is not as effective because there are no stakes in a flashback, which I thought was a brilliant comment and a good reason to evaluate, a good way to evaluate your flashbacks. Are there any stakes in your flashbacks? Whatever happened in the flashback occurred in the past. And although the in events may influence the characters or give the reader a deeper understanding, it rarely adds to the current tension you've built up in your story so far. So constantly be looking at, are there any stakes? And if there are no stakes, then there may not be any tension. Okay, um, on, in your handouts, I um, took some examples and, and modified them. It's funny because every time you read something you wrote, whether it's published or not, you go back and you go, wow, that was a mistake. Oh, I should have corrected that. Oh, that was, that was a wrong word used. So 
I, um, I have a couple, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and pull out in case you haven't read the handout. I'm just gonna use a couple of these examples to compare. Um, in the writer's compass, which I believe is in uh, chapter eight, I believe, stage five. Uh, it explains and gives examples of developing tension. tension. I think there's a counterintuitive process to it because we think if we do fewer details and it moves faster, 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 the pacing is faster, then the tension's higher, but that's not necessarily true because you can make it so fast that your reader didn't have time to engage. And so the tension's lost. So a lot of times what you wanna do is slow down and give a few more details. You know, you wanna give fast sentences, shorter sentences. You wanna make sure you're not using too many adjectives, that you're using strong nouns and verbs to keep the tension tight. But by telling a few more details, it's more visual. So um, here's an example of that. Blake pulled his knife from the holster in his boot and threw it. Cutter gasped and went down, the knife protruding from his belly. So in one sentence, we've said what the outcome is. But you've sort of missed all the tension in it. So let's give another example of that where we've added details. And we have time to absorb what's actually happening moment by moment. Blake stepped back. Cutter's reach was longer. One deep swipe from his knife could be deadly. Blake crouched, maintaining his balance in order to bounce backward if Cutter lunged. He reached into the knife holster in his boot. Cutter eased forward on his right foot. Blake moved from his crouch, the weight on his left leg as he pulled the handle free and threw the knife. The blade struck deep into Cutter's upper torso, centered between his ribs. Cutter sucked in, stared at the knife, then stumbled backward, stopping when his back hit the building, then slid down the wall. So do you think, which gave you a sense of more tension, the first one or the second one? Two, because of the details. So that was a few sentences. It was slower, but the details increased your sense of seeing what was happening, being there, being part of what was happening. So that's always something to think about when you're trying to increase tension in a situation. Are you going through it too fast? And there are some authors that will have, you know, a long, long page of tension, uh, maybe multiple pages of a tense moment that covers a few seconds or a minute or two. So to create a story arc filled with tension, the overall tension should grow in intensity until you finally reach the climax. However, there will also be smaller moments of tension throughout the story. Um, tension is all about balance. Let's see, I think this also came from the New York book editor. That was a great article and I hope you'll look it up. Um, tension is all about balance. Remember to allow your tension to ebb and flow. Not every moment of your novel should be tightly wound because that's too exhausting. It's the symphonic play between relaxed and taut on every layer that makes your story turn the page gripping. Okay, let me see. Let me see where I am on time. I set my timer and then my clock went off. I mean, it, my phone closed and it takes me two minutes to get back into it. To see You're, what's fine. You're fine, Nancy, you have tons okay. of time. Okay, good, okay. So let's take just a minute. And if any of you would like to share the original writing prompt, your sentence. And then after that, we'll talk about character tension. And then after that, we'll go to the paragraphs. So would anyone like to share their sentence with us that we did in the writing prompt? I would like to try. Okay. My name is Lillian. And my sentence is actually a question. Why didn't anybody prepare me for this constant hounding? Mm. Okay. Good. Now, let's give her a little bit of how she could take that to the next level. Now we realized this was just a moment in time that she wrote. 
and I think it's interesting. And so what could she change add to that to make it even more interesting, even more tension? How about if we knew a little something about the character, who the character is, right? So if we know it's Lillian, or Lillian, I'm sorry if I pronounce your name no, wrong. That's, that's fine, Lillian is fine. Okay. My character is a young woman who was constantly subjected to mind meld controlling her behavior and forcing her to act like a doll without awareness. Okay, so there is a tension around that. And this yes. is one sentence to increase the tension in that. So any other thoughts about how we might add another beat or another moment to that sentence? Maybe something about a personal feeling or experiences like sleeplessness or panic attacks, something like that. Okay, good, good. Um, so yeah, so um, this constant hand hounding has led me into another panic attack or uh, I'm not saying that's a proper way to say it, but that's an idea like that. Um, another one, I thought of one and, and it went right out of my head. But does someone else have that? What about something about the setting, Nancy? Yes, thank you. Yes. So yes. metaphors. Metaphors are just your friend. And if you want to understand how to use a metaphor, pick up a Sue Grafton book. I'm right now listening to her whole series on audiobook. And I, I think she's the queen of metaphors. <laughs> She will, she will describe something and use a metaphor to further describe so that you get a, an image. It's something that you would, you would be familiar with. And when she says it and says, you know, this person was dressed like um, a dusty cowboy who'd just come in off the trail, that would be a metaphor. Will you immediately get an image? Um, she sashayed sass into the room as though she owned it, a madam of her own house. That's not a good one, I just made that up. <laughs> it needs more thought, but, but if you will just look through, you don't have to read the book, but look through her description and how she uses metaphors. Well, metaphors are a great way to increase the tension. You know, um, the same hounding as I, I feel when I'm in a panic attack or whatever. This helps to increase the tension because it helps the reader to understand at a deeper level what you're talking about. So Lillian, thank you very much. Great job. Quick. Thank about you. There. Did somebody else have a, a sentence they'd like to? Uh, sure. Good. Um, her first memory came a week later as she woke from her coma in a morphine haze. Water, she whispered as urgently as she could. Okay, so now, this gives us a question, right? What is she, why is she in a coma? And was it from the morphine? And how did she wake up? So there's several questions that you can feel the tension coming off that from those questions. Other comments? And as we said earlier, questions help to connect us with that tension. And then around that would be more details about, about who she is, or we would already know that from earlier in the story and, and what put her in that coma, but okay. Good job, thank you. Um, anyone else have one they'd like to share? I'll go. Okay. So my uh, sentence is, the girl ran through the forest. Okay, so running is a tension word, right? Unless it's playful, running is a tension word. Running, you always, when you're writing tension, you always want to look for words that induce tension, that make you, that bring tension, make you think of a tense moment. So now we have the questions. Why is she running? Who is she? Where is she running to? What is she running from, right? So all of those questions 
that's a sentence to help build information around those questions. And as you answer those questions, they should lead to a next larger question. Good job. Other, other feedback on um, Jacqueline's. The fact that she talked about the forest, forest is mystery. Uh, the description of a forest can create more danger. Good, very good, very good. Um, um, Bill had a comment in the chat that perhaps some memory flashes or partial memories. That was help. about me, Lillian. That was about Lillian's. Yes, yes. Very okay. good. Very good. And I think that actually applies to more than one, right? Of the, of the uh, sentences. Good job. Now, I did see a couple of hands. Pam, did you have your hand up? Yeah, a hint as to the age, because that could help us be, it would be more tense if it was a child, probably. Okay, good. And that's something else we all automatic, because I, I visualized a young adult. I don't know if it was or not. So sometimes we need to, that needs to be one of the questions we answer either in the sentence or right away, so that we're not all thinking about a different age person and then we go, oh, oh, I wasn't thinking that at all. And Terry, did you have a question or did you have, I mean, a comment or did you have a sentence? No, I thought you wanted an addition. I thought you wanted a new opening sentence. I do, and, and Julie, let me ask Julie too. Did you have a comment or do you have a sentence? Comment? Okay, give, go ahead and let's do your comment first. Um, I'm on mute. Just, go ahead, go ahead, Julie. Just simply saying um, something like heart pounding, the girl ran through the forest or the girl ran through the forest with her breath burning in her lungs would increase the tension and let you know that it definitely wasn't a happy running through the forest. And that brings me to another example for a metaphor, like a, like a rabbit being chased by a wolf. Yeah, very good. Okay. Um, did I miss anyone? She ran, I see, and she ran thrashing through the forest. Good, oh, thrashing, that's a tension word. Okay, um, Terry, you have a sentence for us. An opening sentence. Um, let me see. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, the stench of rotting corpses filled Detective Anna Mangione's mask, even with the vix spread under her nose. Good, good, good. Now, and yeah, then, it's a, it's, I'm a sick mind and I'm writing my first detective fiction. <laughs> so all of my examples, I write action adventure and I usually write from the male point of view. So, so my character's usually men, so I get it. Believe me, we're on the same page here. Very good. Um, I, a lot of tension words and then immediately we have questions. Where are these corpses? Why are they rotting? Clearly she was prepared. She had the Vicks under her nose. Um, good tension words in that. Any you want me to read the following sentence? Sure. Okay. Um, she bar this is, goes back to Mangione. She barely breathed, her throat gagged, eyes watered, and she studied the partially decomposed bodies of four young women upon the, oh, that were um, on the stainless steel tables in the autopsy room. Okay, good. So you started with a que question and you, you answered it, some of it in the second one. Right. You elicited a gag reflex in all, uh, most of us, I think, or a, a, a level <laughs> of discomfiture, nausea. Um, so that's a connection to your reader, to your audience. Any other? Um, Thoughts. Good job. Um, I see Terry and Carol looking into her eyes. Why don't you read it? Looking into her eyes, he could see she was lying. Was she protecting herself or him? Okay, good. That's a good tension beginning. Now, how can we help him add some details? that make that even more vivid or...
Okay, so this is a sentence we would probably have where we already know something about the characters. We know what the relationship is. Um, line is a tension word. So maybe if there was something reflected, which probably just is, I'm assuming one of the, she probably just told him something that may have been a lie, correct? Is that correct? Right. So now he's looking to see was she lying or maybe a hint or a metaphor of how that made him feel. It made him feel angry that he was being deceived. Um, and whether or not her eyes might be darting back and forth would be a, a, a tell as to the fact that she was lying. Good. And Lillian says, uh, what, why does he think she's lying? So is there something you could twist in that to say why he thinks that? Um, let's see. I saw, oh. So Jacqueline, you say maybe putting the words differently. Jacqueline, can you give us a little more explanation about what you meant? Actually, that was for the one before. Oh, OK. <laughs> That's the one thing about chat, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Um, darting or avoiding eyes. Good. Darting eyes could mean middle anguish, not necessarily lying. So that's good because that becomes a tension between is he misreading? And then her eye, uh, Phyllis says her eyes lied and that he knew. Okay, so now he's more certain that she's lying in that. What do you think, Terry? I, I like it. I'm thinking that I want, I would want his uh, him to know it because this is a detective story. Uh, I think I would want it to him to know it because his his gut was ringing like a three alarm fire bell. Um, so if I'm looking for- Did you say that? Yeah. It, say that? Yeah, I'm thinking it needs to be something more like that. I like the idea yes. of, of him having a response, but it needs to be inside of him because that's the character. Good. And there we have another metaphor. That's a great way to use metaphors. Um, Julie says he, he felt like he was stumbling in the fog. Good. Mm. Other middle one. Nancy Roxy has her has her hand up. Roxy, hi. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, what's the relationship between these characters? Because you said it's a detective story, but um, there seems to be like some stakes in the sense that he's wondering if she's lying to protect him or herself. So maybe something that kind of hints at whatever the relationship is there, because I feel like it's more than you know, detective interviewee. Yeah, it, it definitely is. And I'm thinking you might could say, looking into her eyes, he could see she was lying like every other mm -hmm. uh, de uh, defendant or whatever term you would define her as. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking as, as we're going through the idea of the metaphor, the idea that, that he's gone through this before, every time he starts to fall in love with a client, which is okay. typical for film noir, type mm -hmm. stories, which is kind yeah. of what I'm looking at now. Okay. Um, so that's why the alarm bell's going off. Right. Um, so, but I can, I can expand on that, so. Yeah, yeah, if you said she, he could see she was lying just like, and then either a metaphor or all the previous relationships or all the women he, he'd fallen for before something. I so I think that raises the level. Good job, good job. Okay, was there anyone else? I don't want to miss anyone, but if there's not, I'll move on. Okay, okay, Sandy, you're my, catch him. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm watching. Okay, so now we're going to spend a few minutes um, talking about character. And please let me know, so I want to do this again with the paragraphs you brought. So um, don't let me go too, too far. Hopefully I'll move fast and I won't go too far, too far along. So 
when we talk about character, I'm going to go back and give a, another example. I, if you all had handouts, I won't go through that. You got, in fact, I won't because I want to make sure we have enough time for continued. So, I'm starting my next section with with number three on the handout. Um, by giving more character information, which is kind of what we just talked about, and more motive, that helps to develop the tension between the characters, especially your protagonist and antagonist. So three is an example of doing what I did above, but now we've got more motivation, we've got more um, character information. So it's a fuller context of what happened in that scene when Blake threw the knife at Cutter. Okay, I'm not gonna take the time to read it, although I love to read my own writing, who doesn't? But I'll move on. <laughs> um, so, and then we can also, you can layer in the descriptions. Uh, you can layer in, uh, depending on where, if you've described your characters before, you may need to remind your reader of certain characteristics, especially characteristics that will increase the tension and improve, or not improve, but enhance what you, you're doing in this moment. So a characteristic that might be important in this moment, you may have said 10 pages ago, but your reader may have forgotten. So one of the things about Sue Grafton's work is that um, she has so many characters and I, I listen to this, I listen to audiobooks, and I can't keep track of them all. And I forgot who was what, who looked like what, who did what, who, you know. So I get lost in the characters. So you always wanna bring back something memorable about the character. And especially that something memorable that will be more tension inducing to show the differences in the characters in the present moment. Um, and you wanna give a description of the, so one of the things we didn't do, a, uh, in some of these with this was a description of the setting, but we referred to that. Sometimes a more description of the setting helps increase the tension. Okay, let's see, I've said, I'm gonna leave, um, I'm gonna leave the rest of this for you to read on your own because you've got the handout. What handout? I don't get a handout. What do you mean handout? <laughs> if you go to the Eventbrite where the Zoom link, Zoom link was for this meeting, down at uh, scroll down to the very bottom, there is a link to pr uh, print out the agenda and Nancy's handout. Okay, I will do that. Thank you very much. Uh huh. And I'm also going to put in here my personal email address in case you have trouble finding it or want to contact me or something. Um, okay. That is right. Is <laughs> I just, I had a change in my personal email address and I'm looking at it. Okay. So I will repeat this from the handout. Um, dialogue can increase or diffuse the tension in a scene. Dialogue is so important in creating tension. Uh, when two people are speaking, there should be moments when they are at cross purposes, even if they're the best of friends, even if they're lovers, there should always be in every scene between every character, moments of tension. Maybe one's trying to get information, the other one's trying to avoid giving the information. One character infers something, the other character misunderstands. Uh, one character wants to do something, the other character doesn't want to do something. So you think about going back to Star Wars, I'm using a lot of Star Wars examples today. Luke, Princess Leia, and Han Solo, they're on the same side, but they're constantly arguing about what should be done, who's going to do what, whether they're, they're just always at odds with each other. And Actually, a lot of funny moments comes out of that. A lot of great lines comes from their, their tension. So for example, when um, Princess Leia tells Han Solo, I love you, and he says, I know. One, it's unexpected, but it's also one of the great lines of, 
of um, the movie. And then when we have a romance, Han Solo, Han Solo and Princess Leia, they're falling in love, but they're fighting against it all the way. Han Solo wants his freedom, Princess Leia, she's a princess, she's got a, a galaxy to save. He's frivolous, he doesn't commit, so they're constantly fighting. And um, at the worst moment of crisis, there is a moment of, in, in more than one movie, there's a moment of tenderness between them. And then when just as he's ready to give in to this love, he thinks, oh, she's in love with Luke, right? So just when you're about to go, oh, they're gonna have to be together at last, he, he misunderstands and thinks she's in love with Luke. And now the tension increases again, trying to figure out how to straighten out this miscommunication between them. All right, uh, now we're gonna talk a little bit about developing the character arc. Um, what does your protagonist want? What's the goal? Getting that goal should be filled with tension to get the goal. If not, then you don't really have a story because you have an anecdote. So the goal should be something concrete, always looking for something concrete. Don't make it too ethereal. Don't make it uh, too emotional. It should be a concrete goal because it's easier to fight for a concrete goal and understand, yes, they're getting it. No, they're, it's being pulled back. Emotional goals are a little bit harder to um, identify. The emotional goal is more about the change of the character, how the character changes. Internal goals are much harder to write and often less interesting because they are self-inflicting and what they produce is angst, which masquerades as tension. My screenwriting students always want to write about an inner conflict with themselves and their, their antagonist is themselves. Those are terrible stories to write. Now, if you're, I'm not saying you can't write them, but for 20, 21 year old students, these are not the kind of stories that they can write. They're too, they don't have the depth of knowledge. They're hard to write. Action tension needs uh, more than just yourself to fight against. So fighting against yourself can be part of your character arc. And, and that growth in who you are and your feelings and emotions can be part of your character arc, but you don't want it to be, um, what you build your tension on. Um, you know what I said I would put, I just realized, Terry, would you retype mine? I realized I sent it to you directly instead of, for some reason, instead of the whole group, would you retype my email address? So um, let me get back to where I was. So in Star Wars, Star Wars, what did the characters want in Star Wars? So to if I win over evil. To win over evil. Good over evil. But let's make it more concrete than that. So Luke wanted to become a Jedi to defeat the Death Planet. Right? He wanted, he wanted to become a Jedi because that would help him to overcome the evil forces. The, the tension is that, is that he had a hard time becoming a Jedi. He had to constantly fight. Then he had to leave in the middle of his training. And then he gets to the evil empire. And what does he find out? His father is the head. Huh? His father is the head of the evil kingdom. Well, there's one person over him, but yeah, Death, Death Vader is his father. So a whole nother level of tension. What does Han Solo want? To be the hero. To be his a hero. Freedom. His freedom. He's all about being free to pull his shenanigans, to and not, not have any uh, responsibilities. Uh, 
and during the whole, he wants freedom, which is not quite concrete, except that they do constantly take his freedom away from him. He's constantly being captured or in danger in some way. He's forced to transport Luke and Leia, which he didn't, gets talked to, which he didn't really want. Okay, he doesn't want to fall in love because that take, would take away his freedom. And yet, clearly, he's, uh, he's fighting against that because he's falling for Princess Leia. He just wants to be left alone, which just wanting to be left alone is a, a strong enough goal. But when you add some of these other things, Okay, so what is your protagonist willing to do to obtain the goal? And the answer should always be die. Now, not every situation, not every goal uh, is about death. However, what the character wants in your story should be as important as life or death. That's what creates the tension. They want this so badly they're willing to go to the end, whatever that means to get it. What's at stake if your, care, your protagonist doesn't reach their goal? And um, again, this has to be, needs to be concrete. Um, in the end, everybody was willing to go to their death rather than to let um, the evil empire win, uh, the Death Star win. But if they didn't reach the goal, if they didn't stop them, it meant the end of the galaxy. So the stakes were really high. So your stakes always need to be really high because that's where part of your tension comes from. Okay, so what will the antagonists do to prevent your protagonist from reaching the goal. And again, this is where you have high tension. Um, this is pretty self-evident. The antagonist will do whatever it takes to stop the protagonist from getting what they want. In uh, Star Wars again, Darth Vader was trying to defeat Luke by telling him, I'm your father. And, and he cut off his arm and he tried to get him to join the dark side. I mean, he was willing to go to any lengths to get to defeat Luke from fighting him and to, and to get him to join him. Nancy, Pam has a question in the chat. She says, is a story about an abusive dad and the protagonist just wants to be free from him, even into adulthood, concrete or emotional? Oops. Um, well, let's, let's all discuss that. It can be both. How do we make it concrete so that it's not, it's stronger than just emotional? He creates obstacles for her to fail. If there, if there is, if it's more than abuse of dad, if it's a specific in that abuse, if you can tie it to something even more specific, then you have something more concrete. So, so like, the, go ahead. So like um, just, a, just a very angry, rageaholic dad that there's constant fighting from day one till the end of his life. And it's a, you know, it, it's about, and, and there's a lot of dialogue and there's um, a lot of activity, um, but there's not like one specific abuse. It's just a constant. So chronic. what you need is a trigger point. You okay. need to pick one event where um, the, is it a son or the? Daughter. Daughter. One event that is over, that ends her trying to make it work triggers her her search for escape and freedom okay okay so there could be that abuse all along but one event that triggers it makes okay. it a stronger okay 
specifics are always stronger. Okay. Specific answers to all these questions are always stronger and help you in forward movement, right? Sure. So it doesn't diminish anything else. It just gives a reason, why did it happen now? Okay. What's the sense of urgency? Okay, Roxy, has a, Roxy has a question or a comment. Roxy, go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, so I know that you were asking that question and talking about specifics. Like, is there a set end goal? Like moving away, going away to college, becoming, getting financial freedom to get away from her dad, like something concrete like that? So again, that could be concrete depending on the story. Um, you want to make the goal big enough that she's willing to die for it. So just going away to college, unless there's more to going away to college, unless her goal in going away to college is a bigger goal, that the end goal is even bigger, more important. It's not just going away to college. It's what going away to college will bring to her or, or what she can do with that. So every time you can make that a more specific, even think about how specific can you make it. The general is harder to get engage with. The specific gives us something to understand and connect to. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does. And it helps a lot. It, it helps me like all that information is there in the story. But what you're saying is helping me to know where to put it in the story now. Good. Yeah. And, um, let's stay on it. There so, was an, another hand raised. Um, I don't know if I'm saying this name correctly. Masande. Uh, yes. Hi. Yeah. Masande. Hi, everyone. Um, Pam, um, your question is so um, interesting. A few examples come to mind from different films. Um, and I'm wondering, genre-wise, is your story like a kind of, um, uh, is it a drama or is it, or would it fit into any kind of genre or speculative kind of fiction? Well, it's actually creative nonfiction memoir. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think um, there are different ways to portray it and it kind of just depends on um, how you want to do it. So I'll use movies just because I've just been watching loads of them and I've, um, I like, I'm writing one, but um, there are films where um, I, I think this idea of having a specific um, goal is very relevant, but also a specific setting. So there's a film that came out years ago called The Stepfather, and that was about um, a a man who came into a woman's life and um, she had a son and the man just kind of revealed that he was kind of a monster basically over time and the son was trying to save himself and save his mother um but there was a specific situation and um the tension um, was kind of racked up because the mother had a stake in the man and initially she didn't see how bad he was and i think kind of having these opposing forces the son was the one who started to see um you know who he really was um and the story started to unravel so i think maybe having opposing forces um and then also uh, maybe using memory as well um so there's a film that came out called train wreck and that's a romantic comedy but actually the main character has a core wound so her father was um a philanderer basically he didn't like believe in love so he set a really like bad example for her as a child and um and that's her core wound so as an adult um, she was very, she thought men were very disposable and that affected her ability to connect with someone authentically as an adult. And her journey was about actually learning how to make that connection. Um, but memory was used in that. And that was, the genre is technically comedy, but the wound is very obvious and easy for a viewer to follow. Um, so I think it just, it depends on, um, yeah, just, just the approach you want to take. And just lastly, quickly, Gosh. there's a film called Run that came out. And in that film, the character has health problems, lives with her mother, her overprotective, overbearing mother. Her dream is to go to college. So there's that tension that I won't give anything away, um, but it, it literally, it uses the uh, trope or concept of college that was mentioned as the kind of, um, the counter to um, the antagonist who's the mother. The mother wants to kind of keep the daughter close 
keep her medicated should she be medicated is the question for the audience um but really she wants that freedom and independence and that's her struggle and journey thank you thank you thank you i i see uh uh, Bill had a great comment about how about if the protagonist is also dependent on the abuser for basic life needs, you know, that creates its own tension right there, you know, as the opposing needs. Um, and Lillian, if she finds out he took her out of his will could be a trigger point. Absolutely, that could be a trigger point, especially she suffered all this and now she's going to be um, lose it, everything. And uh, Diane, uh, she discovers there's life outside her religious cult. That's another, another uh, way of broadening the story, giving it more specifics. So those are all great comments. And Isaiah, um, great mention of the Save the Cat books. Uh, I have three of the Save the Cat books here. I don't have the newest one that I think it's about series television. But thank you for mentioning that. Okay. Um, okay. So I want to, I, I think we've covered this pretty well. Um, thank you. Yeah. So, and I think my notes I've covered, I just want to say at the end, tension is all about balance. This again came from the New York book editors. Um, tension is all about balance. Remember to allow your tension to ebb and flow. Not every moment of your novel should be tightly wound. I already read this. I just put it in my notes twice. I apologize. Okay, now let's get to your paragraphs. Um, somebody had entered their paragraph. Let's see, Terry. Terry, let's go to you. And then we have Jacqueline as well. Okay, good. Thank you. Are you there, Terry? Yes. Am I the Terry you're referring to? Oh, are you the, are you the Terry? Yes. yes. I'm. Thank you. I, I was looking at two Terrys. Yes, Terry. Thank you. Could you read your paragraph for us? Okay. Uh, let me go back to it. I think I wrote the whole thing before. Um, Is this a of rotting corpses filled Detective and Manigiani's mask? even with Vic's um, spread under her nose. She barely breathed, throat gagged, eyes watered as she studied the partially decomposed bodies of four young women uh, on the stainless steel tables in the autopsy room. They had been raped, tortured, and mutilated before they were killed by a cold-blooded savage. Okay, now this is strong. But what do we, what is the thing that would make it, that would tell us how this involves Detective Anna Mangione? What's the thing? I mean, she sees this, but now what is she going to do about it? My, the question is, what is her role in this? How is she impacted by this? And you could use a metaphor, you could use a, a moment from her past, a flashback from her past. Um, you could use, she, had, she did not, she had chased this killer before, she didn't, didn't catch him, she's now, she doesn't wanna chase him again. You can use a lot of things, but now you have to increase the tension, you have to take us to what, what is going, what her motivation is, what her next step is. And now we go, oh, wow. Oh, wow, now we're concerned for this character and what she's gonna do. So it goes beyond the moment into the future. Does that make sense? Um. There's a see the, the the difficulty I've been having with this is that she's having a conversation with the medical examiner while all of this is going on. Okay. And um, she comes to the she believes that there's more bodies 
that are about that are buried in his backyard. Okay, so now maybe so in the dialogue, you can bring up the things that create more tension. She believes there that there are more bodies in the backyard, mm -hmm. and the medical examiner says, "But you've got to have." You got to have enough evidence to get a search warrant and they're going back and forth and then how is she going to put herself in jeopardy to to find this out to discover to learn what she needs to learn to catch the killer right so we need to know what the next step is to increase our tension about what's going to happen next okay. does that make sense yes it does uh which then will uh, then, in which case, I will be rewriting the entire, the, the entire first chapter. <laughs> oh. Well, that's what writing is, right? But, it, it, you know, rewriting, after you kind of look at it, you go, what was I on drugs when I wrote that? So you want to kind of uh, get, a, you know, so I, no one has ever told me what you have said. So I, I really appreciate that. Oh, well, thank so Beyond the moment into the future and... Um, she will be putting herself in jeopardy. It's just not going to happen as quickly because, unfortunately, the, the main murderer, there is an accomplice, um, commits suicide by cop. He comes out of the house and starts shooting, which, of course, is because he doesn't want to face, you know, like being electrocuted, uh, going to jail, being put in a cage, etc., because he's really a coward. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I forgot to say too, is you want to make sure that at the end of every chapter, even if it means cutting your short, your chapter short, you want a question that increases the tension and makes us read the next chapter to find out what that is. So you okay. can read your chapter after that discussion, because okay. we got to read the next chapter to find out what she's going to do. I, I just need to ask you one question. Yeah. Um, in the, you know, this is the first, the opening, but she also has a life outside of being a murder detective, you know, a homicide detective. Mm -hmm. And she's going to go home, shower, because her, all of her clothes smell of the autopsy room, which is horrible smells. Mm -hmm. And so, and she's been going with her colleagues who sing in a group to a karaoke contest that night, which mm -hmm. is sort of like breaking the tension. After a long haul, a couple of years calls up off themselves. Right. And thank you very much, Nancy, on that. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Good job. Um, I see Rox. Who was it that also raised their hand earlier? And um, it was Jacqueline, and I don't see her right now. She said she put a message in the chat. Oh, there she is. She put a message in the chat that her phone died, but she's back. Okay. Um, and okay. then Roxy's is. She said, you mentioned using metaphor. Won't readers grow weary of overused metaphors? How many do you suggest per novel of, of 80,000 words? Okay. Yes, readers do get metaphors can be overused. And in Sue Grafton's work, sometimes I go, oh, just get on with it. I don't care. Um, so yes, metaphors can be overused. Um, so it's a good... I think what you have to do is use them and, and then when you revise, you go, I think I overdid the metaphors or, or get other readers to help you with that. There's a balance between, and some of it depends on your character and, and your per point of view. So she uses first person. So in first person, she can get away with using more metaphors and it's a, a good device for her, but there are in, in, other forms or other characters, it may not be, and it's part of her character's personality. 
So there are a lot of things that come into play with how many metaphors to use, but learn about metaphors because it's a good way to add to your writing, to enhance your writing, add description, whatever. Okay, I hope that helps. So, so um, Jeff Jacqueline is back and then Roxy. Okay, thank you. So you wanna read it, Jacqueline? Sure. So, um, but uh, well, first, can I explain something really quick about it? Um, so I wrote this originally as a short story okay. for a creative writing class, but I really want to expound on it. I want to, you know, take it further as for a novel. So, um, so pretty much it's very vague in this part. So, and so it, it might be, it might sound weird, but that's pretty much, I love being mysterious. I'm one of those type of writers that like to, you know, introduce people mysteriously before I actually get into the actual story. Anyway, so the girl ran through the forest, trees that she knew by heart rushed by in her peripheral and the limbs of bushes snagged her clothes as she passed. It was a force she was familiar with and could outrun her pursuers. The only problem was the dogs that they had unleashed. She didn't think she could outrun them. Okay, nicely done. So, my first thought is, there's two, it, the wordiness slows it down. Not the descriptions, but the wordiness. Um, so read the second or third 